This video is going to be about suspension geometry. Now I made a previous video about springs and anti roll bars and how changing different settings on those can um, help you improve the handling of your car. So you can think of this as part two of that video. This is going to be about how changing the actual geometry of your suspension can um, help your car handle better. Now I wanted to cover everything in one video but the video was getting so long that I had to divide it into two parts. So this first part will cover the camber angle, toe angles and the steering geometry so the KPI and the caster angle. And for the second video, that will cover um, things like roll center, pitch center, because they're really important in racing. And also the, the different types of suspensions used in cars these days. So the double wishbone suspension, the McPherson strut, and the multi-link, and some of the benefits that they provide. And also some of the tricks that manufacturers use in the geometries these days, things like virtual pivots. But first off, I just want to start off by explaining some of the benefits of having a good suspension geometry. So in racing, a good suspension geometry can really help you extract the most possible grip out of your tires. So it can make your car grip and handle a lot better. It can also make the difference in how your car feels. So a good suspension geometry can help you add a lot of stability. And it can also make your steering wheel feel a lot better, so provide more feedback and responsiveness. But it is important to know that if you get some of these angles wrong, they can also make your car pretty much impossible to drive even in a straight line. So suspension geometry is something that you really need to get right if you want a car that feels and handles really well. So starting off with what's probably the most talked about suspension angle, camber. Uh, camber is basically when you look at the, your tire from the front view, it's either tilting your tire towards the car or away from the car. So if you tilt the top of the tire away from the car, that's called positive camber. If you tilt the top of your tire towards the car, that's negative camber. This is measured in degrees, degrees from vertical. So basically if your tire is perfectly vertical, that's zero camber. So the point of adding camber in racing is that, let's say you have a tire over here that's perfectly vertical, so it has zero camber. On a car that's standing stationary, this would mean that it would have a nice rectangle contact patch. But now let's say this tire goes through a few corners and um, the red arrow is the cornering forces try to, trying to pull the tire one way. So what these cornering forces do is that they deform the contact patch. So now rather than the contact patch being a nice rectangle, um, it looks something like a triangle. So basically the outer edge of the tire um, does most of the work and the inner edge of the tire does really little work because it has really little load on it. So you're not optimizing the tire to the full potential. And you can see the deformation of the contact patch in this video as I weave the car. If you look um, right along the control arms, you can see how much the tire is flexing as the car uh, weaves. So the point of adding negative camber is to tilt the tire one way to basically counter the deformation of the contact patch. So rather than the contact patch becoming something like a triangle, you bring it back to a nice rectangle shape while the car is cornering. But the downside of adding so much static camber would be that in a straight line, you really compromise your grip because now going in a straight line, your contact patch, rather than being a nice rectangle, it actually moves to being something like um, the case in the middle. Like it looks something like a triangle. Uh, so you compromise your grip in the in straight line acceleration and braking, but you optimize your grip in the corners. But since in time attack or in any circuit racing, cornering is so important, it's generally more important to optimize your grip in the corners rather than optimizing it in a straight line. Um, that's why you'll never see cars running too much negative camber in drag racing or in any events where the car only has to go in a straight line. But in any type of circuit racing, you'll definitely see cars running at least some degree of negative camber. Now the best way to tell how much camber you should add is by measuring the temperature across your tire. So basically, the best indication for if you, want, if you have to add more negative camber would be that when you measure the temperature across your tires, if the outside of your tire looks way warmer than the inside of your tire, then you know that you need to add more negative camber because that's an indication that the outer edge of your tire is doing all the work in the corners. If you notice that the inner edge of your tires is getting way warmer than the outer edge of your tires, that's an indication that you're already running too much negative camber. Um, so you've tilted the tire so much that now the inside of the tire is doing all the work in the corners. And generally if your cambers are well set up, you will see a more even uh, temperature all across your tire, so along the outer side and the inner side. Um, now the way people usually measure these temperatures is either by using an IR infrared temperature sensor or using a pyrometer specifically meant for measuring tire temperatures. Um, some racing teams actually go as far as putting infrared temperature sensors on their cars that actually measure tire temperature as they're actually driving along and going through corners. Now another benefit of setting your cambers properly is that it can make a big difference in terms of tire wear. So these were my uh, set of tires on the E55 before I made any changes to the camber. So from the factory, this had negative one degree of camber at the front, which obviously wasn't enough because if you look at these tires, all the wear is on the outer edge of the tire. On the inside of the tire looks pretty much new. Comparing that to the set of tires I put on after making the proper camber adjustments, 
Now on this set of tires you can see that the wear is pretty much even on the outside and on the inside of the tire. And this tire has actually been through more track days than the previous set. So these were my final numbers for the E55. I was running negative 3.5 degrees camber at the front and negative 2.5 degrees at the rear. Um, that's what worked best for me, but this would be something that's different for everyone because for every different tire and for every different car, um, it would require a different amount of camber. Now the other thing about camber is that it never really stays where you set it because camber changes on a lot of different things. Like um, as your wheel moves up and down, the camber changes. So depending on how much your car pitches and rolls, you're actually changing the camber. And it also changes depending on steering angle because when you move your steering wheel, you actually gain or lose camber. Um, so those are things I'll talk about later in the video. But for now, I want to talk about the other really important angle, which is toe angles. Toe angles basically refer to the direction your tires are pointing in um, when you're looking at them from a top view. So if your tires are pointing straight forwards, that's basically zero toe angle. Um, if your tires are pointing inwards, so if they're pointing towards the uh, center line of your car, that's toe in or positive toe. And if your tires are pointing outwards, so away from the center line of the car, that's called toe out or negative toe. And the reason why toe angles are so important is because certain toe angles can uh, make your car more stable to drive, but other toe angles can pretty much make your car impossible to drive, even in a straight line. And generally a slight bit of toe in can make your car more stable to drive, but toe out, especially toe out at the rear, will pretty much make your car impossible to drive. Um, and the reason is pretty obvious, because if you think about your rear tires pointing outwards, um, that means when you'll go through the corner and your car tips more weight to the rear outside tire, um, you already have a rear outside tire that's pointing outwards. So it will try to force your car into a spin every time you go through a corner. Um, so that's why toe out, especially at the rear, makes your car really unstable to drive. But generally a slight bit of toe in does help you add high speed stability. Now there is a bit more to toe angles than just that when you get into all the tricks of um, running a slight toe out on front wheel drive cars and running toe in on rear wheel drive cars. Now the other important thing to know about toe angles is that they can be influenced by the forces acting on your tire so they can change slightly. Uh, depending on whether your car is accelerating or decelerating. Because if you think about production cars, they use a lot of rubber in their suspension. And what happens is all this rubber flexes when the suspension goes through different forces. And that can actually cause a slight change in toe angle. And that's obviously not such a good thing because if your toe angles are changing as you're driving, that's obviously going to make your car more unpredictable. Now there are geometries out there that can help minimize this. Race cars will try to avoid this problem completely by eliminating any rubber in the suspension. But even in production cars, there are certain geometries that will minimize this from happening. Which brings me to the next few angles, which are related to the steering axis. Now, if you've ever noticed how the front wheels turn on your car, you would probably have noticed that they do not pivot about a vertical axis. Uh, the steering axis is actually slightly tilted. And you can kind of see that when you see the wheels turning. And the reason behind that is there's two main angles, um, steering axis inclination and caster. And these two angles are extremely important in terms of how your steering feels and it, they can also uh, make a difference in the performance of your car. So now generally here's what the inside of your wheel would look like on most cars. It would have a brake disc, a brake caliper and also a wheel bearing somewhere in there. And after that there's a knuckle and then on the knuckle there's going to be two ball joints. At least for cars with a double wishbone suspension you're going to have two ball joints over here. And if you draw this blue imaginary line through the center of these two ball joints, that's your steering axis. So that's the line along which your entire wheel will pivot when you turn your car. Um, this is also called king pin axis. Um, king pin axis and steering axis are basically the same thing. Uh, from where the term king pin comes from is that before in older cars, there used to actually be a there used to actually be a pin along which your entire wheel would turn, and that pin was called the king pin. But these days there's no kingpin in a car, there's just two ball joints and um, the line passing between the those two ball joints is either called the kingpin axis or the steering axis. So just to explain what would happen on a car if the steering axis was perfectly vertical. So in this example the steering axis is perfectly vertical and this is what the wheel would turn like if your steering axis was perfectly vertical. So obviously you can tell right away that something's wrong with the way the wheel is turning. That's not how the wheel turns on a real car. Um, and the first problem you'll run into with something like this is with something called the scrub radius. So the scrub radius is the distance from the center of your contact patch to the point where your steering axis intersects the ground. And the reason why the scrub radius is so important is because when you look at it from this view, uh, let's say the red dot is the center of your contact patch and the blue dot is your steering axis or the point where the steering axis intersects the road surface. So the distance between these two points is obviously the scrub radius. Now let's say you go on the brakes and um, and the tire is obviously trying to slow the car down. 
So let's say this red arrow is the force, it's the grip of the tire trying to slow the car down. So now you can probably see that this um, braking force on the center of the contact patch will also have a turning uh, force on the steering axis because it's offset from the steering axis. And what this turning force will do is it will not only try to cause a toe out every time you go on the brakes, but considering your tires are at different um, grip levels, it will also try to pull the steering wheel one way. So let's say your right tire has a greater grip level than your left tire. What will happen is that every time you go on the brakes, the car will try to pull to the right. So when you think about this in a front wheel drive car, it will also have toe in when you go on the power. And it will also have something called torque steer, which is what, whenever, whichever tire has the greater grip. It will actually try to push the steering wheel the other way. Um, so that's obviously not such a good thing to have. That's why you always try to minimize the scrub radius. Now one of the ways how you can minimize the scrub radius is by adding this angle called KPI or SAI. Um, KPI stands for kingpin inclination and SAI stands for steering axis inclination and they're both exactly the same thing. Um, so all this angle is is basically tilting the steering axis. So if you're looking at your tire from the front view, um, what this angle is is basically tilting the steering axis one way by moving the top ball joint towards the center of the car. Um, and when you do this, you'll notice that now where the steering axis meets the road surface is actually much closer to the center of the contact patch. So that reduces the scrub radius considerably. And if you do this too much, you can actually cross the center of the contact patch over and go to something that's called a negative scrub radius, which means that your steering axis intersects the road surface um, on the outside of your, um, of your center of your contact patch. And there are actually some benefits of having a negative scrub radius, which is why some newer cars will actually go with having a negative scrub radius. And just to quickly explain the benefits, I'll just use this example over here. So in this example, the blue dot is the steering axis where it intersects the road surface, and the red dot is the center of the contact patch. So you'll see that the blue dot is this time on the other side of the red dot, so it has a negative scrub radius. And let's just say this car also has electronic brake force distribution, so most newer cars will actually have this. And let's just say that this is an extreme example and two of your tires are on ice and the two tires on the right side are on a dry surface. So the car only has to use the grip of these two tires to slow the car down. Since it has electronic brake force distribution, it will automatically send more brake force to these two tires. So now the problem with this would be that if you imagine the inertia of the car trying to pull the car forwards, which is the green arrow in the middle, um, if you combine all these forces, this will have a rotational force on the car. So, so that rotational force will try to move the car towards the right. But now if you think about what the negative scrub radius will do at the front, it will actually try to move the steering wheel towards the left because of this force. So if you set the negative scrub radius to the right amount, you can actually cancel these two forces out. So that would mean that you can go hard on the brakes and even if only two of your tires have the right amount of traction, they won't pull the car that way, the car will still stop in a straight line. The same way you can also use this geometry to eliminate torque steer, so you can do this in front wheel drive cars. So you can go hard on the power and even if one tire has a greater grip level than the other, it won't pull the car one, it won't pull the steering wheel one way and the car will still accelerate in a straight line. Um, so that's why this geometry is preferable in some newer cars. But usually it's not as simple as just putting more um, kingpin inclination to achieve a negative scrub radius because there are downsides to having that much KPI. Um, so there are some complex geometries out there that they use to achieve this type of geometry. Like most German cars these days would actually use virtual pivots, and that's something I'll talk about in part 2 uh, when I talk about the different types of suspensions used in cars these days. But talking about the other effects of KPI, so if you imagine a wheel moving with um, kingpin inclination, the wheel would look something like this when you turn the wheel. And now you can see that the wheel isn't simply just um, moving right or left, it actually does change camber when it moves along too. Um, so if you look at this from the front view, you'll also see that KPI also has a bit of lifting force on the car. So every time it moves to the left or to the right, you can see that um, the steering wheel, uh, the, the tire is actually going below the ground surface. Now obviously in real life, the tire can't go below the ground surface. So what it does is it actually lifts the car up when you move the steering wheel towards the left or towards the right. And what this means is that having too much KPI will make your steering heavy because you're actually doing the work of lifting the car as you turn the steering wheel. Um, but a benefit of this would be that it also uh, applies a bit of self-centering force on the steering wheel. So every time you move the steering wheel to the left or to the right, the steering wheel will try to return back to its forward position, um, which is good for adding a bit of stability to the car. But in racing, the other downside of KPI is that it also changes the camber. And if this is the inside tire on a car while you're cornering, it will actually increase the camber in the right way, so which is beneficial. 
But if it's the outside tire, it will actually camber the tire the wrong way. Um, and the outside tire is the tire that does most of the work in racing um, because the outside tire is where all the load is in the corners. Um, so if you're cambering the tire the wrong way, obviously this angle is not too good. So that's, that's one of the reasons why you try to minimize um, KPI, kingpin inclination. Now the other extremely important angle for steering is the caster angle. And caster is also um, shifting the steering axis from vertical, but this time looking at it from a side view. Um, so in the longitudinal direction. Um, so if you move the top of the steering axis towards the rear of the car, that's called positive caster. If you move it the other way, that's negative caster. And negative caster is something you'll never hear about in any car because it has really bad effects. Um, but positive caster is something that almost every car will have. Because without caster, cars would be really difficult to drive. Because now, if you notice where the steering axis intersects the ground, it's actually in front of the contact patch. So you get something like a typical geometry that you see in shopping cart wheels, where the steering axis would actually be in front of the contact patch. So what happens in this case is that whenever you move your shopping cart, you would have noticed that the wheel always follows the direction you're trying to go in. So caster does pretty much the same thing, but in a car. So it would always try to point the steering wheel in the direction the car is going in. Um, so when you come out of corners and you let go of the steering wheel, you would notice that the steering wheel would return to its forward position. And this is extremely important for giving you feedback when you're driving on the track because whenever your car goes into a spin or anything, the caster angle actually tries to compensate for that and it tr actually tries to move your steering wheel into the skid because now your car is no longer moving forwards, it's actually moving sideways. Um, so if you've ever drifted a car or something, you would have noticed that if you let go of the steering wheel, the car would actually counter steer by itself. Uh, so caster is the angle that helps you do that. Um, without caster, cars would be almost impossible to drive at high speed because um, going down the highway you would constantly be fighting with the car trying to find the center position on the steering wheel. But with caster you can even let go of the steering wheel and the steering wheel will always point straight. Um, so that's one of the biggest benefits that caster provides. Now in terms of how much caster you add, the more caster you add the steering wheel will become heavier and heavier so you would actually need to make more effort to actually turn the car because it will try to, because the self-centering force will increase more and more the more you increase the caster. Um, the more you decrease the caster, your steering wheel will become really light, so it will be easy to move your car, but then again, you won't have that much amount of force feedback in your steering wheel. Now, talking about the other benefits of caster in racing, um, if you notice how the wheel moves, now this wheel has caster and KPI, so it has um, 15 degrees of KPI and 10 degrees of caster, which is pretty typical in what you'll see in most cars. Um, most German cars will actually put 10 degrees of caster, which is a little on the high side, but then they have strong power steerings too, so they need a bit more caster to actually um, provide the correct amount of feedback in the steering wheel. So now the thing you'll notice about how the wheel turns, um, it actually gains camber the right way in both directions, so that's extremely beneficial for racing because, because racing teams will often use this caster to actually use those camber gains in the corners, because rather than running too much static camber that also slows them down in, in the straight line, like in straight line braking, this caster won't, this cam, this camber gain will only come in when they're actually turning the car. So they can actually run less amount of static camber and then use these camber gains that the caster provides to actually um, provide the proper level of camber in the corners. Um, so this can be extremely beneficial for racing. Now I also wanted to cover the Ackerman steering geometry in this video, but since the video is getting so long anyways, I'm just going to leave this for the next video. Um, but let me know if the video was helpful. I know it's a bit of a long topic. But I'll try to cover everything else in the next video whenever I get some time to actually finish that video. Um, but anyways, um, thanks for watching and let me know if this video was helpful.